just meeting a 25 year old kid that has figured it out to a degree that he's got like financial and time freedom already don't you think like isn't it crazy yeah yeah i was i was thinking we were obviously talking about how <laughs> you wish you had that <laughs> yeah <laughs> when you were 20 25 but doesn't it just like highlight though like if you can get yourself to that situation, the entire world is your oyster. If you can get yourself to the point where you're like, the business is doing well, I don't have to be specifically anywhere. And you know what? I'm going to move to Bali for three months like he is doing. Like it opens up so many more doors. It's, it's, it's a totally different like belief system and something that, yeah, as I say, I wish I kind of knew earlier, but it only comes through putting yourselves in positions and either meeting people or environments to actually get exposure to that. Forget what we were speaking about earlier, obviously about YouTube and the resources and podcasts and things around that that's what people have access to now. And you never wish you were in a different time per se, but we just didn't have that exposure earlier than what we did. And so I think it's awesome that they, people like that are putting themselves in positions as early as possible Yeah. To, to see that because all we knew was the school to uni to nine to five and how would you know anything outside of that unless you put yourself in a position to expose yourself to other things? Do you, yeah. um, do you think, because obviously you run a program based on what you've successfully done with your brother, do you feel like a lot of people recognise how much leverage can be created or are they kind of coming in hoping to make like another 5K a month mm. when the reality is if you do it properly... In yeah. e com, you can kind of make another 100, 200, 300k a month. It's, it's crazy. I, I like, no, people don't understand it. You know, when they come in at 2k a month, 5k a month, 10k a month, all the way up to sort of 50k a month, they might come in. Um, they expect it to be like just linear, right? And so, especially coming into festive seasons and, you know, Black Friday periods and stuff like that, I'm basically telling them almost every single day prepare to be doubling quadrupling your revenues during these months like prepare for it literally mentally but also stock levels cash flow levels ad levels emails everything you need to do prepare for that because you can go and, and i just tell the stories of clients i've worked with right that have gone from two to four to eight to 16 to 20k in consecutive months and so that just blows people's minds but that's why e-commerce especially is so favorable because of that scalability Mm. and it's just, it's not um, that hard mm. once you understand how to do it and get that leverage, right? So obviously paid ads is a big lever point. Um, databasing is a big lever point. And then the organic side kind of just fuels both of those things. So the way that we kind of see it from a marketing perspective is literally those three prongs. So I call it the marketing triangle. Paid, database, organic, and they just are all intertwined, basically. Mm. Um, and, yeah, the leverage is huge once you, they understand how it works. What, um, do you get a feeling the minute that somebody comes to you and they've, they've said, most people come to you and they've got, like, their own product, right? Yeah. Most of the time they've, they've like, developed it overseas or do you have, like, a, a gut feel over, oh, this person will murder? Or, like, what... What is it about a product? And obviously, we were talking about <laughs> it's so easy. Just build a really good product <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then that kind of takes care of everything. But do you get like a gut feel of like how well somebody's going to do just based on the product that they sell? It's actually more based on the person, to be honest. Yeah. So we speak with a lot of people with a lot of different products. And my experience tells me to never judge a product. Um, because I don't know everything about every industry or, um, or niche or whatever. And, and people ask me that too on sales calls and throughout the community. It's like, well, how can you be an expert on X, Y, Z? And I said, I'm actually not. We've got the formula for you to be successful that works across the board and we'll find those little opportunities for you. But the product, I'm not one to say that the product will be accepted by the market. Yeah, so we, we definitely only work with established brands with um, doing about a minimum 2K a month in revenues and that shows that there is some market validation there is a traffic source there that's available yeah and we can push on those opportunities and leverage them even further so that's kind of the first sign that they are initially kind of successful but 
uh, and the product will be successful in market because it is too hard without any validation, without any market or traffic source, any sales to say if it will be successful or not. And to be honest, my opinion doesn't mean anything. Yeah. It doesn't. So my response to them is always, we'll help you find those opportunities, but the market is going to tell you if they accept it or not. Yeah. Um, so when it comes back to the actual person, I, I can read people better than I can read the success of their actual fundamental of their being their product, right? Yeah. So they just need to have the willingness, you know, to be successful. And that's how they'll find it. And there's a, there's a really good um, quote. I think it's in, it's in the E-Myth, I think, when he talks about um, the difference between successful business owners and not is literally just the willingness to do so, to, to solve the problems. Everything can be learned. We all started from nothing and had to learn something. Mm. So it's just the eagerness and willingness and urgency with that, the speed, I Got guess. It. So, I kind of find that about um, like our space as well and like predominantly design business owners. You, you can speak to somebody and tell, I was telling you that story about that guy that was prepared to move back in with his grandmother. It's like the willingness to do that gives you a huge indicator. So like what... Like when, when you speak to people, like what, what are maybe some of the characteristics outside of that where you're like, this, this person's, they've got it. Like do you, because obviously the, the more people you work with, the more you kind of unconsciously find this pattern around mm. who's doing well. So like, what, what does it take? Because at the end of the day, everybody's just following instructions as a, a little bit of a shortcut, but they're still learning as they go yeah and that's that's all anybody's doing to move in any successful direction so like what what's your gut feel and what other things are kind of i think i think the biggest up? the biggest thing that i observed is um just the taking responsibility honestly just knowing that it, it is all up to them you know you can lead them to the water they've got to be able to drink it um and with that as i said before kind of that urgency and willingness to keep progressing, they will just honestly eventually get there. But it's up to them, whether it is one year, five year, 10 years, 100 years, to reduce that through obviously our knowledge and our experience and asking the right questions, um, getting the market feedback, bring it back to the table. So they're very um, act they're action takers, like fast action takers. Yeah. They take the instructions, they bring it back to get the next um, instruction basically. Mm. So I'd say like those are the two main things is the responsibility side of things. It's never anyone's fault or cause or whatever if they've hit roadblocks because roadblocks are always inevitable no matter how high you get up the tree. Mm. And then just the speed to action. That's a pretty powerful combo. The, um, the amount of people we spoke to that said that COVID was the, the worst period of time for their design business... Was, was probably 90% of people we spoke to, but then people within the mastermind, 90% of them had their best year in COVID. And, and it's like, well, like how is that possible? And it's, it's as simple as people use external events as excuses as to why something did, didn't basically happen. But then mm. you private further and you're like, okay, COVID was really bad. How much outbound marketing did you do? We didn't. We were just relying on word of mouth and referrals. And it's like, how many times did you follow up? We didn't. We made yeah. sure they hopped on the first initial call and then that was it. Um, yeah, so responsibility is a, a big one. And in, without sounding like way too crass, but you're, you're going to be a bitch to the world <laughs> if you don't just own every do, is there any part of your existence that you feel like you're not responsible for nah nah not at all i mean nah not at all it, it probably did when i felt you feel out of control in my position it was kind of in a nine to five job for example mm. you know but i knew i'm not sure how i realized this because some people go through and will just blame the world and other outside circumstances for as long as they kind of live but there was a point which luckily i found that i said i just can't blame that circumstance and have to take it upon myself you know and so exactly right you know what you mentioned before um i've got a lot of clients in mostly new zealand and australia and the ones in new zealand every second person i speak to on a, on a call in or out of the program are blaming the recession the economy and all this sort of stuff and it's like well what are you going to do about it 
And like you said before, with where they're not doing the inputs, it's the crutch that they use. The excuse becomes the crutch to not do the work. Mm. And if they just took the responsibility and did the work regardless, you know, they may not see the result today, tomorrow, next week, next month, maybe it might take three to four to six months to compound, but mm. they will be slingshot forwards twice as far. And so that's where within our program, it's so much about the inputs, you know, the, the leading metrics we call them basically. Mm. Tick your box and give yourself a pat on the back every day that you do your leading metrics. The output, the lagging metrics will take care of themselves. And so we get messages all the time throughout our community. It's like, do the work, do the work, do the work from people that have seen the path that they've gone through and finally getting the results. People get results on different time horizons based on the maturity of their business and the types of activities and the confidence they have and things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they take responsibility is the major thing. Yeah, that's isn't that funny? It's like I'm, I'm realizing just the that there's an entire layer. Like the E myth kind of highlights the idea that people get stuck in the doing of the actual thing and thinking that's the realm in which they'll get successful. But hearing somebody that has built a, an e-commerce brand and helps other people do the same, a lot of designers would be like, "Oh well, that that is irrelevant to me." But everything that you have explained around what creates a successful business in that realm is exactly the same as ours. Um, so that's that's kind of the the taking responsibility standpoint. The what what we tell a, a heap of people is from like a um, speed standpoint that it's amazing how you can get somebody in who is thirty five years old in any space or like let's say fifty for example. And they're like, I've got 20 years of experience doing what I'm doing. But then you ask them, like, how are things going? And, and from a business standpoint, they, they're still kind of moving at like a nine to five kind of salary speed, which is completely fine. But it's, it's kind of not taking advantage of your situation. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got a 25-year-old that we've just met today that's probably a multiple six-figure design business owner, right, who's off doing these really entrepreneurial things. And it's like, if experience really mattered, how has this 25 year old got more time and financial freedom than 99% of people <laughs> in the world? You know what I mean? Um, and I've, I've spent a heap of time thinking about this and it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a crackpot theory, but the way that I think about it is, like you were saying, there's, there's two really important things that matter. The, the first is, it's the speed in which you make decisions. So obviously the mm. speed to make take action is mm. like you were saying, but but without being able to take, you can't take action unless there's a decision. So what happens is that the way people screw up is, the way that people screw up or do really well is they move really quickly or they move really slow. That's the first vector. So some people can see a problem and then it takes them an, a month to solve it. So you can speak to some people and go, how's progress? And it's like a month later and they're like, oh, well, I've just built my website. And it's like, that should only take an hour, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got other people, Just the, I've got this private client, um, his name's Gabriel. And I gave him my video sales letter structure for my design business. And I was like, here you go. You know, that'll take a week. He literally gets back to me next day with the whole thing recorded. And it's like, like, you know, it's like, man, this guy's, He's going to kill because he just moves too quick. So you've got that vector. So you could, rate, you could rate people on a scale of zero to 10 from a speed and decision making, right? Then on the other, um, let's say the horizontal axes, it's are you focusing on things that get you paid or not paid? Yeah. Right? So think of the business world as a maze and there's a section of the maze that's challenging and difficult. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it wasn't your fault. <laughs> um, there's a part of the maze that's difficult, but at least it's going to get you mm. paid. And then there's a heap of the maze that's off to the left and to the right that is difficult, but you're not going to get paid from that. Mm. And people who move towards outcomes really quickly can differentiate between the things that get you paid and don't get you paid. And a lot of the times, the things that get you paid are the harder things to do. And it's way easier, like, um, is it Michael Gerber, the e-myth? I think mm, that's his name. Yeah. He says a lot of people default back to their skill set, what they're yeah, really good sure. at. And 
the problem with that a lot of the times it's not getting you paid it's just fulfilling the work that you've already won so if you've got zero to ten that flies I just want to smack it (laughs) (laughs) zero to ten speed and decision making right and then zero to ten are you on the path that gets you paid or not this is why you can have somebody that's one out of 10 speed of decision making and one out of 10 on the path who is moving very slowly through the section of the maze that's not getting you paid. So even though they're moving slowly, they're progressing very slowly on things that don't matter. And then up the other end of the spectrum, you've, you've got people that move really quickly on things that actually matter and get you paid. Mm. And that's why this literally 25 year olds mm. who have a multi six figure salary and then 50-year-olds that have been at it for 20 years and have the experience, yeah. but, but they're nowhere. It's, I feel like it's kind of a multiplication of those two things, if that makes sense. For sure, yeah. And with that axis, as you mentioned, like the first thing is that speed is subjective, right? So someone can think they're moving fast or progressing in a month, as you say, and they come back and say, look what I've done. And you're like, are you serious? It took you that long. And they thought they were moving fast, right? And then the person who's taking the action... Um, probably knows they're moving fast, but they're just so used to it, that's normal for them. Mm. Um, But then on that second part of the axis, as you mentioned, you know, effectiveness versus efficiency, people feel good and default to things that, as you say, they know or they find easy. That's why we default to checking social media or clearing the inbox in the morning because it's reactive and it feels good and we feel efficient, but it's not effective. Mm. And so we can spend eight hours a day or however long you spend in your business, three hours a day, you know, doing efficient things but never moving the needle it's like i'm working so hard i'm working so hard right and that's the thing with business owners as well we we everyone works hard they do at what they do it just depends on what time allocation Mm. but there's also not like a nine to five you just don't get rewarded for working hard (laughs) like the market will determine if you've done the right work the effective work Mm. so figuring that out as as quickly as possible as i say like it's subjective with how quickly people figure that out or get the feedback back through their actions and things like that. Mm. And so that's, in my opinion, and this is something I explain to my clients all the time, it's a good thing it's subjective because you can always get better at it. Always get better at it, right? Um, but yeah, absolutely to your point, it's, it's interesting seeing those two people, whereas the 55-year-old's probably like, I deserve this. I've been doing it for 30 years, as you say, 40 years, whereas he's just having a go and working it out as he goes along, basically. Yeah. With no fear. You know, that's probably, that's probably where youth is an advantage, of course. And yeah. when Sam and I started our e-commerce business, we, we left our full-time jobs. You know, I was working in property valuations. He was at Macquarie Bank. And we literally had no fear in leaving our business. We, oh, sorry, leaving our jobs to start a business. Like we, we didn't have any liabilities. We didn't have, um, we weren't married at the time. Mm. And we just moved back in with mum and dad you know like this kid and um and took every day as as it was like we were just fully we were that kind of the optimist that you need to be as you know starting your own business yeah um and then when the shine wears off after 12 months or so then the real you know you got to keep the momentum going fuck this the shine kept on for a while (laughs) oh mate i tell you what yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. i mean it was it was a yeah three four five years slog for sure before anything was figured out um, I was really lucky to have Sam as yeah. in my brother. Because he's, he's a couple of years older, isn't he? Yeah, he's three years older. And yeah. he was the, the big driver of the ship. And he, um, he come from fi- like a real strong finance background, yeah, obviously. Yeah, accounting. That would have been a massive um, advantage. Uh, to a degree? Yeah, I guess to know the numbers, for sure. Like we, yeah. you know, he was spreadsheet, 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 and, and just working out margins, for sure. Numbers is a big part of business, understanding of numbers, regardless of what numbers are, whether they're financial or just data for um, data's sake, right? Like measuring and understanding what you're in for is, is everything, in, especially in my experience. And that's what we pull back to our Econ Blueprint community. It's like, know your numbers, right? So the first thing there is, even if you do nothing else but track your numbers, you're going to be aware of what your baselines and standards actually are. Yeah. And so by doing that, it's like when you, you know, if you start weighing yourself every morning, and you're trying to lose weight, literally by physically weighing yourself in the morning and tracking that, you'll yeah. start to think differently when you go and go out for lunch. You're going to buy the salad rather than the meat pile or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you yeah. just start to compute things subconsciously. So yeah, knowing your numbers in business is the same thing. What, um, 
how many how many of the people that you help know the numbers off the top of their head when you ask them who are struggling barely any of them yeah, yeah, yeah. it's exactly the same for our guys yeah. as well yeah um and I mean, like with your business as well, but this is the funny thing. Like I, I could ask you what your cost to acquire a customer is. I could ask you what your ad spend is. I could ask you what the, the team closes at. Mm. I could ask you like all of those things. It's astonishing to me that people don't know the answer to those questions. I, we, we can speak to people that can't even tell us what top line revenue is for the month. And I'm like... If you're not thinking about that, like, what are you thinking about? For sure, yeah, yeah. Firstly, definitely <laughs> like, what, look at the revenue and cash. That's the easiest number. Yeah, like, but they'll they'll be the first ones to tell you that they're overwhelmed and stressed. Yeah, and so that's what again what people come into the community with. It's like, okay, they're overwhelmed and stressed because they have they have a lack of information, and you have to first know the information. You first have to know what information you need, then know how to actually read the, the data and the metrics, yeah. because then you can plug the gaps. Like the customer journey in an e-commerce business is very, very simple. Mm. It's like, obviously, sell the click through the marketing. What's the conversion rate on site? What's the add to cart rate? What's the checkout? What's the actual purchase conversion rate? Um, average order values, all that sort of stuff. So if you can see it in a straight line like that, mm. then you know where the bottleneck is, right? And obviously, couple that with um, KPIs, you know, baselines. Yeah. But your baseline is going to be different to someone else's as well. There's ideal KPIs, but... That's where um, they have to be kind of modified based on your context yeah, a little. Exactly, bit. you know, yeah. depending on how what your average order value is. Like, if you're saying something for two grand or fifty bucks, like they're going to be different, of course. Yeah, uh, but the, the the journey is the same, isn't it? It's, it makes me realize, like, the the only thing that matters to master business is is to get your information systems to a point that you've got clarity around what's actually happening. Don't, yeah. you, don't you feel like <laughs> yeah, like like you can get stuck in the romance of doing something, but unless you obsess over the spreadsheet and you can't rapid fire your numbers, you're kind of not focusing on the right thing. Yeah, like I, I, I literally, everybody that I speak to that can recite their numbers is, is not struggling because the minute that you measure something, you focus on it. And then like I, I could... I could have timed us just then and gone, hey, Will, you know, we've just come from uh, Umalas where my villa is and come to the recording studio. And just by telling you how long it took us to get here increases the likelihood that we beat it back. You know what I mean? Because we're, we're yeah. measuring it as a metric. But yeah. Um, yeah, I always find that so bizarre. What, um, there's, there's obviously like a, there's like a unwillingness to do something that boring, but, do you, I, I find this like a big connection between boring activities and making a heap of money and doing really well. Do like, and you've had this as well. Like you experience big revenue months. There's something really distressing about getting to the end of the month and then starting back at zero. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but um, it's, it's just funny to see how connected and how boring a tracking sheet can be, but how that, that is the key that unlocks everything, I suppose. So you, you were kind of explaining that your, the whole framework that people go through in order to, to grow an e-commerce uh, e business is really built around basically spreadsheets, right? And the habits mm. that allow people to fill them in. But like, what kind of objections do you get, if any, around the willingness to conform to, to what you've laid out, like based on what you've figured out works yeah um it's a good question because it's the same thing with like taking the responsibility right yeah like it's gonna be time um it's really i don't know where to find it because we've obviously shown them where to to find it um uh, yeah it, it's 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 probably mostly time which is a crock of shit you know <laughs> we've all got time especially for the really important numbers uh and if it's going to make you five thousand ten thousand a hundred thousand dollars if you position the question like that to someone they they get to work pretty quick just who's tracking that mm. um but but that's that's mostly it i mean there is no excuse like we have to show our clients tough love when it comes to that because there's nothing more important than knowing that and as i say those ones if they don't if they are busy and stressed and whatever it creates this bigger snowball and i still come back to knowing your numbers and that will alleviate at least half the pressure but then like you said, with a successful person, 
they know where to press or to focus. Like if, even if the numbers look terrible and terrifying, you still know where to press. Like I say to people, like even if your numbers are zero for the day, put them in. Put mm. them in because tomorrow they'll be one, the next day they'll be two because of your intent and awareness of those numbers that you track. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, there's nothing more powerful than putting a zero down five days in a row. <laughs> yeah. And it's you very, do something it's nearly it. impossible for, for somebody to put a zero down five days in a row because after the third day, you're like, fuck, well, what am I doing here? Mm. And it, it's, the magic is the idea and like every, everybody's tracking sheet moves left to right, right? That's mm. just how they work. You start at, what is it, column A and then yeah. you move towards Z. But, but the minute that you see, I don't know about this, but the, the minute that you see data coming in on the left side of the tracking sheet and how it filters down and the ratios that are created between getting people to the next step, that to me is complete control. The minute you get to that point that you understand the relationship between the inputs and the outputs, there's no need to stress about where you're going. Mm. You know what I mean? That's absolutely right. Yeah, it gives you clarity. And, um, and to solve that problem, right? So, for example, we, we use this formula called the Magic 3, right? It's basically like anything to do with sales and revenue in an online business, e-commerce business is... Traffic, conversions, and lifetime values, right? Traffic's obvious, conversions obvious. Lifetime values is like bringing people back around to spend more. So they're the, the three major things that people look at. And so if conversions are a problem, we obviously have a look at that. We work on that. We say we're going to get your conversion rate you know, above 2%, 3%. Again, depending on product specific, right? The average would be 3% or like a good KPI would be 3%. Yeah. Um, as soon as we hit that, it's like, okay, we've got to tip more traffic in. So setting expectations and giving forewarning them in a sense is knowledge, right? So say, okay, you're going to spend money on ads. Okay, if you're on Meta, you're going to spend money on ads. You're going to get more cold traffic. Your, tra your conversion rate is going to drop, not back to the floor. It's just like it'll come back 0.5% or something like that, mm. all right? Then we actually work on what's happening there. We actually give it some time. Like even, as I say, expectation setting is data, like, which they borrow obviously from us. Mm. Um, with that knowledge and expectation, they don't freak out because they're like, okay, cool. How long do I give it, Will? Okay, 14 days, 30 days, track it, make sure it's on in line. Then it starts to creep back up because that traffic starts to convert. Um, and suddenly you're getting more traffic and converting at the same rate before increase in sales, right? So it becomes this kind of push and pull between those two sources. But that's just an example of um, knowing, it, like having the expectations around the data. Mm. Same thing when people do run ads for the first time, they, you know, sometimes shit themselves because they're like, I'm spending this money, I'm getting traffic, but it's not converting. Mm. And so to know that this complex algorithm, whether it's Meta or Google or whatever, mm. takes seven days, 14 days, 30 days is just powerful. Yeah. Like I feel like half our job is actually probably more. Certainly mental, but confidence building yeah. and supporting. And then the other stuff, skills that they can learn and we expedite that process for them. But, you know, a lot of it is just, the confidence to back yourself or back that decision. You mentioned decision making before. Huge. Yeah. Huge. It can mean everything. So yeah, that's um that's a big thing is expectations around data as well. Yeah. Just a baseline, a KPI. We we find um m most design business owners we speak to that have tried paid traffic. No, in in fact all of them bar one. I've had one case study in seven years where somebody uh has spoken to the team and we've asked them, uh, you know, they've, we've said, what are you doing to grow the business? And they've said, oh, we're, we're running money on ads. And we've gone, how's it working? And they've gone, it's killing. <laughs> it's only happened once. And um, the, the, reason, the, the reason that I think that is, is basically paid traffic is really a magnification of how well the business is working right now. So if you can take somebody that's never heard of you and you use a free strategy to get them to your website, irrespective of whether it's a product or a, or a design service. And that person goes and books a call, they have a, a positive sales call and you throw them an offer or they see a product page where the, 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 the cost of the product made sense based on the value of it, they close. If you then magnify the speed or the velocity of people seeing that page, you're gonna do well, right? The vast majority of designers and, and business owners build something and then they don't confirm it with free traffic. And then therefore, it's, it's like they've got a bucket 
that they're doing a two kilometer walk to the river with, but they haven't confirmed whether there's holes in the bucket or not. And then what happens is you rely on that bucket and you throw $2,000 worth of water into the bucket and then you're absolutely mind blown that it all completely seeps out the bottom, right? Mm. The easiest way I've found to think about paid traffic is build the offer, work your ass off for two weeks to create organic traffic, to get proof of concept. And then once you've got proof of concept and there's people transacting or booking calls, you know you have the bare minimum amount to convert X amount of the next 150, 1,000 people that you bring through. Um, and that kind of brings me on to conversion because you um, were talking about the fact that you, that's like one of the key things, traffic, conversion, mm. and obviously increasing average customer value. What are you guys, like what, what are you guys helping with from a conversion standpoint? So what kind of things are you manipulating to, to help increase like confidence in, <laughs> in consumer sentiment, for example? Yeah, there's, there's some fundamentals and this, this comes from experience, like being consumers, having a business to know, like there's no certification about what converts. It's actually just putting the eyes of a customer on. So when it comes to conversion rate optimization, CRO, um, we're looking at obviously apps you can plug in, but honestly, even before we look at anything, we ask the client, what is it that you do and who is it for? That's it. And if we can't see that in above the fold, meaning the first frame of the website, whether it's on mobile or you're on desktop, then they've got their messaging completely wrong. So above your assets and your marketing, right? Assets being your socials predominantly, Instagram and your website and then you've got your marketing that feeds into that above that are just your foundations meaning your messaging your product market mm. messaging so like you were saying before where ads an amplifier of what you've already got they're an amplifier and this is you know we can go into agencies if you really want to but this is where the business owners make mistakes where they say i'll just throw paid ads i'll get someone else to do it and i'm you know i'll be a millionaire tomorrow agencies are only working with what they've got which is the the business the, the fundamentals of the business and if they're not well structured well thought out, well positioned, using the language that their typical customer uses, not appealing to the customer that mm. they're trying to target. That's when they get terrible results and claim that they got burnt by agencies. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah, that's the, that's every burnt with agency exactly, story. Exactly, it's never not that. And it's like they're working with the assets that you, they've got. They're not trying to be bad agencies. So, to your point, but they before, are bad agencies. If if you can't. If you can't correct, pick that correct. up, yes. No, if you can't pick up that the assets are shit. Correct, but that's that's ninety percent of agencies. They won't change yeah. anything about what you've already got. They'll say you provide the assets to me. Your website's fine. Like let's just run ads to that, and they you know go three months and then they're gone. So you're right, yeah. And that's the majority of these churn and burn agencies. Um, but with conversions, um, the messaging like just one hundred percent number one. Um, having like a picture with the message as clear as day who it's for. Like people want to get all artsy and um, not even like necessarily like philosophical about their business, but they want to be like beautiful and creative. When the front page of your website from someone who's never seen you, doesn't care about you, uh, hasn't seen you before, they want to know who it's for. So the best messages that we see and the examples that we use is um, like treat it like you're speaking to a five-year-old. Mm. So literally a lot of people we recommend just saying, number one, like Australia's number one kids dinnerware kind of thing, if that's what they're doing. Mm. You don't have to show the website and you know what it's for, who it's for. Mm. It's got a picture of the kid eating dinner with the plastic stuff or rubber stuff, whatever. Mm. Um, another good one is obviously benefits versus features. So um, one of my first clients actually, they did a hangover supplement. So just like it was, it's pharmaceutical grade. Mm. And like on, initially they had on their website, which was around how good their ingredients are and this and this and stuff that I didn't even understand. I said, what do people actually want? And they said, well, they don't want to hang over the next day. All right, cool. How much does it cost? Like $4 a serve. That's your message. Like 100% hangover guarantee for as little as $4. What else do you need to know? <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So, so the messaging just forms everything. Um, the, the second big part is probably social proof. Yeah. So that's in the form of obviously imagery, how they're using it. Reviews are just massive. Again, they're probably like, we're talking about email databases and things in terms of priorities. People don't prioritize them enough. They are huge drivers. Like you look at Amazon, which one are you going to go for? The one with 10,000 or the one with one? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Which cafe are you going to go to? The one with 10,000 or the one with one? Um, we've had people come up to us in cafes when we're wearing our 
Karmic gear, for example, especially back in the day, and they're like, oh, I just ordered from you because I saw someone I knew on the review or it resonated with them, right? It's saying what you want to say, but in someone else's language and perspective. Yeah. Problem, solution most of the time. So, so they're the two biggest things, but also, you know, mobile, mobile friendly, obviously. Um, we used to say when we started Karmic that we almost wanted people to like trip over themselves and buy without almost kind of knowing, right? And that's kind of the theory of as little steps as possible. Mm. right so you don't want people to be going back and forth trying to find information about your shipping and um whatever else they need to find out about the product before they buy because they're likely to get lost or you know leave right <laughs> the, so. the, uh, I'll, I'll give you the um the uh, I, I figured out we we give everybody a, a website template in order to to book calls for their design business i figured this out it, it it's so silly but i i heard i think um i've told you about alan sultanic right this mm. Like I like the the innovation and like how to improve a business in any space always comes from outside of that space. This guy, um, I listened to a replay of one of his calls, and he's like, "Yeah, the the easiest way to to get people to convert on a page is to give them nothing else to do." <laughs> so what we did is we built a a one page landing page where every button all it did was scroll down. Mm to the, the Calendly link to book a call. Mm. And that that is outconverted any page I've seen of anybody in the design space because you're giving them nothing else to do. Mm. And I, I feel like what happens is when you get stuck trying to fit in to a way that a company or uh, an industry does things, you forget what your actual objective is. Yeah. Um, and simply just giving people one thing to do is the easiest way to get them to do that thing. But the, the other thing with case studies and testimonials, the, the only thing that matters is, is getting them. Don't, don't you feel like, mm. I, I find like if you, if you think about selling a product or, or selling your training program or selling a product or service, I, I personally believe that both of my businesses are, are there to produce case studies and testimonials before anything. So the way that we optimize where I invest my time is how do we get the next customer to an outcome that's insane so that the minute they're on a, yeah. oh, this is amazing, I'm, I'm having such a good time, you know, I've got the outcome, cool, do you want to hop on a Zoom call and let's, let's chat about it? Bang, capture it, put it onto YouTube, it's another one. If you just focus on that, money just magically follows that. Um, so, like, what 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 kind of um, what kind of strategies or like what do people do to go from, you know, selling maybe a few things to to selling way more things and and capturing like what what's the best kind of approach for like what kind of things do you teach around trying to get more social proof and and get more testimonials and or it's probably more like reviews from, yeah and, it is, and more trust yeah it's it's all trust based i mean and the you know industry will tell you that like response rate or, or call it conversion rate if you want to of reviews like a good conversion rate is like five percent so literally we're talking about customers here mm. so of a hundred customers a good conversion rate is five people conducting a review Again, think about our own consumer behavior. Even if we're happy with it, we have good intentions. We're like, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. And then it disappears and you hope it kind of floats to the bottom of your inbox and you never see it again. So it, you're exactly right. It becomes a massive priority. Like the, before I kind of answer that question, what you said before, that's actually part of, you know, the flywheel effect. And math has to be massively part of, I'd say, everybody's business, no matter what you're doing, service or product, yeah. is prioritizing happy customers. Yeah. Because as that flywheel turns, and you probably know from the theory, it's like, you know, five to seven points of the flywheel would self-perpetuate, build momentum and, you know, um, turn, turn it. So that's part of one of ours is happy customers, customer reviews, because that means we've got a great product at the back end of that. It feeds into obviously more marketing, um, got more opportunities to, to push our brand and we keep increasing the um, value of the product essentially and the experience. So... That, that makes everything easier. As you say, if you focus on the reviews, it comes back to the actual quality and the experience of people that are having, mm. that, which is the main focus of what it should be. And then everything becomes easier after that. Like the wrong way to build a business, especially service-based, is <laughs> focus on marketing a, a terrible product. Like spend all your time building a great product and continuing to improve it. And yeah. the marketing actually becomes easy. 
Yeah. And that is a big thing through reviews and testimonials. So yeah, coming back to your original question there, um, literally by any means necessary is the short answer. So incentives, yeah, they work sometimes and, and they work quite well. Um, it might be cashbacks, like honestly, we'll give you 10 bucks credit or something like that. Mm. Um, people do competitions, you know, you can review, like get a big um, uh, competition going, win 200 bucks or something if you fill out your review. But honestly, what's worked the best is honestly just follow up like crazy. Yeah. So a lot of people have apps like, you know, judge.me and all those sorts of things that um, we use Yopo um, that are automations, of course, and that's cool, that's good, but that's where you get that 5% response rate. So we instruct our clients to say, prioritize this because obviously social proofing is amazing. It goes into all of your content. Mm. You know, you use it splattered across socials, obviously ads, um, obviously it's on your product. So there's so many benefits to having reviews. Um, but at the end of each month, basically resend all the uncaptured reviews and you, that people normally get a bulk of like five or 10 or 20 or depending on the size of how many obviously customers they have over that month that mm. just that just come in. So that improves their rates there for sure. Yeah. Um, but then being almost ruthless is what I'd say with getting that. So if you have to jump on a phone call, like online businesses, we somehow hate talking to customers. I don't know why, <laughs> but a big fundamental is that we are customer centric. Mm. Right? That is like one of my major five customer centric and all of your problems can be solved by talking to a customer. So if you get on the phone and like, I'm the owner of XYZ, they'll be flattered for a start. Mm. You can have a conversation, ask them two or three questions, obviously give them a little incentive and say, oh, by the way, I've just sent you the review. Can you do that for me? And they'll be like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I, like I said, the short answer is by, by any means necessary, but prioritizing that. Yeah, that's massively. a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. Um, Alex Hormozzi has a, I saw a, a Twitter post like a week ago. He said, 100% of problems can be solved by looking at your data or speaking to your customers and most people do neither. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, the two things were spoken about quite heavily, you know. <laughs> okay, this, 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 seems, this seems so funny, but like, I'm going to ask you a question now and I want you to give me your honest <laughs> answer, right? How, how fucking hard is it for you to help somebody market and grow an e-commerce platform, right? If they've got a big outlandish promise for their product, but no testimonials, no case studies, no social proof. How, how much by a factor of what X is that harder than somebody that has a product that does exactly as, as it demonstrated with a thousand case studies and testimonials? How much easier is that business to market? Yeah, the one with the testimonials has got to be probably at least 10. I've got 10? To, probably, probably 20. Like, they, as I say, it's just a matter of traffic in that sense, right? Yeah. Like we say, that when you go to Amazon, it's the same experience. You've got to put the customer's glasses on. Like, what, what are they looking for? They don't care about you. They care about the benefit they're going to get from buying that thing. And they see that when other people are. Um, saying that that's the exact result that they got. Because all, we learned this really early on, and this came from, um, um, I guess he was kind of a mentor of Sam and I's, but he's a good friend. He'd started a lot of cafes, and he started um, Loon Croissants in Melbourne. It's a big thing, and now it's global. And he said, people just want their expectations met. Like, at the very least, they want consistency. Mm -hmm. So he was saying, from a cafe perspective, they want to go to the same cafe and get the same cup of coffee every single time. McDonald's model, you know. Yep. Um, and so we took that through as well with ours. But that's how people... Um, transact right so that's why unboxing videos and things like that are really great because they like it's a bit of mistake and they're like okay I'm going to get exactly that yeah yes yeah, and so they can they can compute almost value in their mind if that makes sense and it helps them transact so yeah man easily 10x easy maybe so, so you say 10x and and then the stark reality for most people in my space is that you go to their their business website and they're they're saying branding or a website or this type of design to grow your business and then there's no documented evidence of anybody that can confirm that and then they've just got a portfolio mm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like why do most people struggle to build momentum it's because like i don't know if you've heard this concept but like um 
this one of the guys in the school games that talks about this idea of the great online game. If you, if you really think about it, all we are doing is we're all playing a video game. And our, our job is to manipulate pixels on a screen so that somebody on their laptop somewhere else in the world sees the right combination of text and images and goes, I'm going to swap money for the promise of that thing. That's the, that's the only game we're all playing. When you think about it, it doesn't matter. It's so simple, isn't like, it? like if you think about it, like, yeah, you guys are selling a physical product. Most of my, my students and, and my design business, we're selling a service and expertise. But where where this massive overlap and half it's so funny half of what you're saying is mm. no it's probably eighty percent of what you're saying that allows your clients and students to be successful is exactly the same as mine, but it's respecting the fact that we're all just playing this great online game, and the rules are the same for you as they are for me, and and all of those rules, yeah, are kind of in parallel. You need to understand psychology. You need to understand mathematics. You need to understand the relationships between inputs and outputs. But it's 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 pretty funny how much parallel there is. It's literally the what what is actually shipped is the the only difference, basically. It's 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 everything, man. The moment that I kind of realized that someone's success in whatever you're doing, but in this case it's obviously business, nine like if you ask someone, you should ask your clients this actually. Like what percentage of your success do you attribute to how you think like what's between the ears like what would you say like for you if you think about all your success over the years like how uh, much would you actually say at least 80 percent. that's what most people would say when they think about it but they've never thought about it yeah and so one of the best things i heard from someone that i've followed quite closely on, on mindset right is if that is the case <laughs> why don't we spend 80 percent or more of our time on how we think in our mind. And that was super profound for me because it, it like, like the skills we're talking about, the ability to, to read data and make decisions and act with speed and all these things that are commonalities is, is universal. Mm. And so, yeah, when I understood that, and that was probably six years ago now, that changed everything for me. Mm. And what do you reckon coincidentally happened? It was like, oh, now I'm making some serious progress. And then you get like a big influx, that hockey stick growth of, of, um, uh, of growth. Yeah. And so yeah, there was a huge realization. So yeah, 100%, the business concepts and how we should operate and how we do everything, how you do one thing is how you do everything, right? And think yeah. is universal for sure. Um, and like you, you've kind of done the same as me, like, we just buy the speed off mentors. We yeah, don't, totally. Don't like, can you like shed some light on um, like th this notion? We've already discussed this, but like, like how much time do you think you've saved investing in mentorship, guidance, other people's intellectual property, and then maybe just through like your network? Like, mm. like well, how long would it have taken? If, if you just, you wanted the award for doing it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, I, I reckon there's like, there's actually two parts of my journey, right? The first answer to that is it would never have happened. <laughs> Literally it would never have happened. And on a personal level, I've got you to thank for that. Like, because you introduced me to the concept, you gave me confidence to pull the trigger on that first mentorship with someone mutual that we, we knew. And I can tell you that that very first investment is so scary. Yeah. It is because you're basically just pulling it from um, belief in yourself, right? And even sometimes you don't have that. So that first couple of K investment in the first mentorship that we did uh, was, was the harder. It took me weeks to think about, right? But once I knew I'd bought the ticket, then I was just all in. So I was still in my full-time job by then. Mm. And every night, after footy training, after work, I was doing the program, the online mm. program. Yeah. Two, three hours. So I did that for two, three months and then I felt comfortable enough to swing on the trapeze and leave my full-time job. So as I say, I wouldn't actually be doing what I'm doing if that wasn't the first case. The second case, not second case, we've invested multiple times, probably spent, not as much as you, but probably spent, you know, 100, 100 grand on, yeah. on formal mentorship and then, you know, books, podcasts, all sorts of stuff. Um, every time 
you've got a decision to make about whether you should invest or not, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter because you know, you're computing in your mind about, as you say, that speed and that knowledge and that access, the proximity, mm. right? To someone that can just give you even confirmation that you're doing the right thing. Mm. That is worth everything to me personally. That's worth everything for someone to say, yeah, all good, you're on the right track. Keep doing what you're doing and, and let's review it now. Or, you know, maybe you need to pivot. Maybe you need to change this. Maybe you need to change that. Like it could be a one degree dial mm. on something that you're already doing to make it 10x better. That happens. Yeah. Um, in 2x is easier than 10x. Sorry, 10x is <laughs> than 2x. He talks about... <laughs> 2x is easier than 2x. <laughs> <laughs> edit that. In no, 10, that, we can in that. 10x is easier than 2x. <laughs> he, he talks about 10x isn't a thousand percent better. It's honestly like just 10% sometimes. So it's that kind of um, relationship when you invest in mentorship. Mm. And, and I, again, I can tell you this for, from absolute fact, like when my dad told me he had a mentor, a business mentor, you know, when I was 15, 16, 17, I wish I had cottoned on. I was like, what are you doing that for? It's such a waste of time. Why would you pay someone to tell you what to, to do? To tell you stuff. That was, that was my mindset yeah. until I was 26, 27, even though, yeah, we didn't have mentors for coming. We, yeah. we just went out. We just backed ourselves and did Yeah, that's insane man, that you guys did it without but mentors. this is sort of what I say to my clients. I'm saying there was five years of stuff that probably shouldn't have happened because we didn't get the help. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's what I put into context. I say, and this is to answer your question, it's like five years of, of you know, we spoke before. Making like mistakes. Of brute force. Let's just call it that. <laughs> yeah. Of bashing your head against the wall and we just had more staying power than a lot of people like Blessing and the curse. Idiots. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> yeah. the, Bash, the Bash brothers. Yeah. But, but that's now what I say to people in the program. It's like, your five years is going to go down to six months. Yeah. That's what I can basically promise you. We'll just give you everything that we should have done yeah. and took way too long to learn. And so, there, you know, you can compute value and you should do that. You should say, okay, I'm investing 10 grand. I hypothesize if I can get these things solved, which I know about and the things that, that I don't even know about. That will easily make me 10x. That's as simple as a decision you need to make. Yeah. You know, the biggest mastermind I involved, I uh, invested in was, was 30K US. It's not like it's a small amount of money, you know, and I have to run that by my wife and all that sort of stuff. And, but I could see the, the blue. It wasn't even about the money going in. It was yeah. like, this is what we're setting up for. Yeah. And within three months, I'd probably recoup that. Since that mentorship ongoing, probably 10x that, 20x that, you know. Yeah. Distant memory. So it's... And then you've got to keep, level, my belief is now that we've been through that, as I say, that's the hardest thing is making the first investment. Mm. Get, the, get the runs on the board, get the belief in yourself that um, what you're doing is right and learning from other people is the right thing to do. And it becomes easier and easier and easier and easier. Like the most successful people in the world who we all look up to have mentors and have had mentors. Mm. And a big thing which I mentioned to you, you know, just before, is that if I see or hear something at least twice, it should be once, but at least twice because it, it, it's memorable that I look up to that are doing what I want to do. Like I listen and then I action that. Mm. One thing was mentorship. The other thing was reading books, mm. right? So that was three years ago. It was only three years ago I decided to read physical books because that's just how I absorb and whatever. So I yeah, probably read... Yeah, books, they're just they're in one ear and straight out the other for me. I yeah. I can't retain yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I physically read, yeah. Physically read and I can bookmark like... I like the physical and then after every book I'll, you know, write notes, just my takeaways and, and all that. That's how I absorb it because you don't want to read or listen to something and not action it. What's the point? Mm. Um, so I read probably a hundred, hundred business books only business. This is my like obsession right now for like the last three years. So reading was the second one. And then, you know, some form of meditation, right? Like you can, you got to find what works for you. Um, it could be journaling. It could just be, you know, quiet moments by yourself. Or it could be hardcore meditation, right? Like the, um, I liked guided meditation for a while and now I do my own kind of mindset stuff. Anyway, it's consistent. But those were the three main things from people that I looked up to were doing consistently every single time, every single time. Now, that's not directly business related, right? Like we were sort of saying before, but it comes into my version of what I think is creating the success of these people and why the hell wouldn't I do it, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Like that's, that's probably a lot of the problem with so much content online is like it makes you feel good watching something but if you're not going to action what they're talking about or be able to link what they're talking about to your circumstance yeah then then you're taking the long way around and the best shortcut is to invest in someone who's done what you want to do yeah the um 
I mean, what what I'm starting to realize from from investing in masterminds and and training programs that the the most important thing is to to actually shortcut the training and go that's nice and good but that's only for now how does this person actually see the world and like what what are the underlying philosophies that this person has about what it is they're doing how they see their life how they see the relationship between a work life balance and try not understand how this person came up with this strategy to begin with because stra- strategies are going to you know remember there was um there was that audio app that everybody went on to and were doing audio chats remember oh, that? <laughs> yeah. came and came and went and yeah, everyone yeah. sold the strategy on how to grow a business on this stupid audio thing that <laughs> hung around for five weeks but if you understood the philosophy of the person that created that, you would understand how to take advantage of the next opportunity. So something I've been working really hard on is trying to understand what do people fundamentally believe at a life level truth that allows them to predict the next wave and then respond to it accordingly, if that makes sense. And then what you're doing is you're gearing yourself for understanding where the next opportunity is going to come from because strategy is going to shift technology, time, marketers, fuck marketing for everybody <laughs> else, which means there's always going to be something new. And that, that's why I'm massive on Ty Lopez because that guy, he's mm. been at the, the front of everything. And it's you're not learning off this guy unless you understand how he thinks about the world because that's mm. what allows him to be first, if that makes sense. So mm. like the, the, the key, key thing for me is trying to understand it's more important there'll be more innovation coming from outside the e-com space that you can steal and bring into the e-com space. The same as me as a designer, most of my progress has come from learning from the traffic and funnel guys or Sam mm. ovens mm. around how to apply it to a design business, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that's the total like blue ocean strategy in a sense, right? T- taking something externally into your market and finding that blue ocean because people over here are doing and saying exactly the same thing in that red ocean. Right? So, hundred percent. And even, I mean, with the, the programs and mentorships, like you you I, I think the moment that I kind of came out now anyway, to, to know that you only need to get like a minimum of one thing that's high leverage out of these things is valuable enough. Like yeah. I used to get a bit paranoid, like I have to absorb everything and I have to soak everything up and action, not necessarily action it, but like, you know, I had to get so much out of it, squeeze all the juice out. Mm. But it, the moment I kind of, relaxed into it and realized that this is what I want to get out of it and execute this and see that eventuate and get the results in, in that way, in that direction is, it was amazing, mm. right? Because I used to anyway, put a lot of expectation on, yeah, getting as much out of it as possible. But if there's some angle that you can exploit essentially, mm. um, and that might be what you're talking about, understanding how these mentors think. Yeah, the, huge. the, um, so I've worked with Alex Becker a couple of times, the guy that founded mm. Hyros and was in his training programs. But there's, Sam Ovens tells a story about him in his 36K mastermind saying that he was looking for whatever the next step was. He wanted to build a software product. Day one of the three-day mastermind, somebody gets up and complains and says, oh, the, the hard thing is I just don't know where these conversions are coming from on my ads. And then 10 other people said, yeah, we have that issue as well. Alex Berker got up and left the mastermind and didn't attend the rest of it, which was like six hours of day one and then all of day two and day three because he got exactly what he needed and then he went off and built a $100 million company out of it. Isn't that insane? Yeah, yeah it's like, insane. You are right. It's, it's yeah. like one thing. That's, that's how I think about reading books as well. Yeah, totally. The, the, the funny thing about books is what, what I've heard from publishers because we've got a couple of designers that focus on helping um, publishers build their um, like their their covers for their books but then they help them market them as well as like the mm. next you know upsell and they explain that the way that publishers work you'll write a book and most of the time the book gets straight to the crux of what yeah. needs to be said and it's like 120 <laughs> pages and then the publisher goes this is great, but we need another 200 pages out of this. So then what happens is the, the, the writer has to then fluff the whole thing out 
so that it actually becomes a book that you can pick up in a shop, right? Well, he says the best way to read a book is the minute, read the front cover, read the blurb, read the introduction and get an understanding of what the promise of the book is. And the minute you feel like you've got an in-depth understanding of the premise of that, shut the book and move on to the next one. Mm. He said, because most of the time, all of the values truncated at the front and then it's basically filler, 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 like plain flour to kind yeah, of so get, yeah. get more out of it, if that makes sense. You can see that, like the, certainly like that first 80 pages, I'd say, of a, of a certain book for sure. Yeah, I always yeah. find that. Like the first yeah. 80 pages are mind-blowing and then it's like, yeah. I can't, I've heard this song before. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> um, this was awesome. Thank you for taking the time to do it and um, offering some insights. But yeah, it's, it seems pretty clear and I think that's what I'll find from everybody I interview is that the overlaps, there's more overlap and similarity than there is stark differences even between our models, you know, mm. so. Absolutely, man. Pleasure. As awesome. always, thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> awesome.